Uh, the panelists can come up to take their seats now. Had, is, had anyone here not seen that footage before on Democracy Now? You hadn't seen it on Democracy Now? Or? So that was the first time. It was very important for me as an artist in residence at NYU with the APA that Yara Lee's vision, the vision of one woman and her camera and her frame and everything that was inside of that frame and how on earth she was able to get that footage out. It was very important for me that people see her vision. So I was in Palestine that day. I had come in from Jerusalem into Ramallah. I'm working on a long poem about the Queen of Sheba returning to Jerusalem, this time through Kalendia. And I couldn't figure out that morning, as we were all trying to get as much information, figure out who of our friends were on the boats, figure out what the official word was from everyone. I couldn't figure out why I was so afraid to go back to Kalendia that day. It was irrational fear. I had to get out of Ramallah before they shut it down. I couldn't make it over. So um, later that day, of course, a New York City art student was shot in the left eye. Again, at Kalendia. Again, there were eyewitnesses. And again, the official report was uh, contradicting. So She Shall is the poem I wrote that day from Ramallah into Jerusalem. The morning is still, see. Shell in my hand, Akka sea in my hair, sunrise yet, waning moon set, salted skin, an ear roaring ocean. The day fire opens, soldiers sky storming in air, hands in defense, hands in exile, mist in return, rain, hands open, Gaza reaching. The day heat sparks hills, tear gas, tears face, vision smoked. Cycle begins, gulf of ache, sound bombed, body unarmed. Color me, marmara. The night, no names yet. Still morning, strip sieged, blockaded, spirit in water. Flesh offers blood, the sea opens me. Cannot keep food down or feed a dream thirsting. The morning caves in. Spin, vacuum, river turning wave. Gray masking ports, sinking ship, waiting still. Weighing humanity floats. An ill wall delays the sun. And I witness moon, memory, water. I stayed in Palestine a month after the flotilla attack, and I um, actually hooked up with Max. At some point, as foreign as you feel here for holding radical or leftist ideas, you get out of here and you're still just an American. And that was the American face I needed to see to make sense of everything that was going on around me. And this poem is for everybody. It's called Into Egypt, not out of. It's a new day, into Egypt, to be ready. You will want beauty as your face. You will want to greet the day with a heart you will wish was open. You will want to be brave and you only fear. Want belief in anything and everything is doubt. When there is light, finally you might squint. The sight of it all might make you. Steady, you will want a vision ahead. Redemptive dissonance, music for the end of, chorus for the coming of, manifest hum into him. The noise of it rivers you. You will cry water into flames, vulture your own heart to feed. You will want to love yourself at all enough. You will want to flee and forget the leaving. You will have to leap, still wanting. You will want to wait for witness. You will want to wait for those already gone. You will want until you are want. You will want until you are ready. You all ready? Yeah. Our round table. Thank you so much, Sawyer. 
Uh, just to give you a sense of how we're going to structure the roundtable this evening, uh, we'll ask the panelists to respond really to three, three questions, three rounds of responses. First of all, the response to the book itself as a, as a particular kind of activism. Secondly, uh, the response to the political legacy of uh, the raids on the flotilla. And lastly, how the recent events in uh, Egypt and Tunisia have, uh, have had an impact on, on our topic for this evening. Um, and then we'll be, we'll be taking questions which we invite you to, uh, to write on in your index cards. Everyone should have an index card, and uh, I'll ask for them to be collected at some point later uh, in the proceedings. So uh, first of all, I, I, I want to ask... Um, uh, Max, Susan, Noam, and, and then Mustafa about uh, their views on the potential power that a book like this uh, might have. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, public, any kind of publication of opinions that are critical of Israeli government policy invite or seem to draw an extraordinary degree of scrutiny and, and often condemnation from certain quarters. In addition, uh, writers like yourselves are up against the ever-vigilant efforts of uh, Israel's public relations machine. And inside Israel itself, we hear about bills being uh, uh, put forth uh, at the Knesset almost every week now aimed at extinguishing any free critical speech on university campuses. So in this kind of environment, why is it so important for this kind of writing to take place? Uh, I'd like you to address that. Max, perhaps we should begin with you because uh, your exposés of uh, the doctrine of evidence on the part of the Israeli Defense Forces after the attacks was a really wonderful, very, very important and well-documented uh, demonstration of, the, of how propaganda not only suppresses opinion but is designed to preempt it. In a way. Yeah, I was hoping I wouldn't be asked to go first. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But I did... Uh, <laughs> I did arrive in Israel, Palestine, right after the flotilla massacre, maybe two days after, and uh, following close on the heels of uh, Noam's rejection by Israel, um, they refused to let him in for unspecified reasons, and I remember as, uh, bef as I was entering, I was a little nervous, and I saw a video on Arutz Sheva, the settler news channel, um, which uh, reports in English because so many of the settlers are from here, from Brooklyn. Um, and uh, Yuli Edelstein, the minister of Hasbara, of the Department of Hasbara in Israel, which Hasbara literally means explain in Hebrew, um, but it actually could be translated to propaganda. So he's the minister of propaganda, and he's asked, why was Noam Chomsky not allowed to speak at Birzeit University? And he said, well, we just couldn't allow the risk of riots. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone stays calm tonight <laughs> for, for this panel. But this is the sort of uh, thing that Israelis are told about um, people on this panel, that they're coming to incite riots, to cause violence against Israeli soldiers. Um, I know Suhair has had a hard time uh, getting into Israel, and uh, her friend uh, Mesun Zaid had an even worse time getting out. She was another uh, uh, friend of mine who we hung out with uh, right after the flotilla um, in Jerusalem. And uh, I just have to say what Hebrew school I went to, so it's a little bit easier for me. Um, now, when I came in, Israel was in an extreme frenzy um, about what they were seeing because um, E.R. Lee's footage was the only footage that escaped off of the flotilla. Um, the rest of it was basically thrown in a trash heap um, or sorted through by the Israeli um, foreign ministry and the Israeli... Um, Army Spokesman's Unit. Um, the Ar Army Spokesman's Unit is headed by Avi Ben Yahu. And what they, and the Ar Army Spokesman's um, Unit has a very close relationship with the Israeli military. Um, during the uh, 1948 war, um, the, the uh, military reporters in, in Israel, their job was basically to tell the Israeli public about the heroism of the Haganah, of their forces. And it remains true to this day. Um, Avi Ben Yahu, who is the sort of the chief of the, of, who is in, who's in charge of feeding information to the Israeli media, graduated from Israeli Army Radio. This is the most prestigious journalism school in Israel, and it is a unit of the Israeli Army. Um, 
only a select few are accepted to this uh, institution. And uh, when they graduate, they're placed in Yediot Aranoth, Ma'ariv, um, the major papers in Israel. Avi Ben Yahu was one of those graduates who went into Ma'ariv, became their chief military reporter, then used it to make connections with Yitzhak Rabin, with Yitzhak Mordecai, the former um, southern commander of the Israeli army, who he defended against rape charges. Um, he, he was one of the many generals in Israel and politicians charged with rape um, by trumpeting his uh, military heroism and using his connections in the media. Um, ben Yahu then became consigliere to Rabin and Barak. Then he moved back into the army um, to head the army spokesman's unit. And so you have a guy who's just, com just completely palling around with all of the top figures in the media, and he's able to use them as a pipeline to the Israeli public to feed propaganda about what happened on the flotilla um, and manipulate the Israeli public so that according to the Institute um, for uh, National Security Studies in Israel, 93% of Israelis supported the flotilla raid. And an, another uh, study that came out subsequently showed that a uh, plurality of Israelis um, thought that the um, Shayatet 13, the unit that stormed the uh, Mavi Marmara, should have killed more, um, didn't, didn't use enough force. This is the result of stories that I wound up sort of exposing on my blog with no effect inside Israel, like that the, uh, the captains of the uh, Mavi Marmara um, told um, Israeli naval um, vessels to go back to Auschwitz. This was completely fabricated, and when I raised questions about it, they issued a clarification, which was still non-verifiable. Um, there were so, so many other claims they made about the passengers on the Mavi Marmara. For example, that there were 40 members, paid members of Al-Qaeda on this ship. I mean, it was so patently ridiculous, I just picked up the phone and called the Army Spokesman's Unit and said, you know, do you have any evidence for this? And they said, no, we don't have any evidence. It comes from Netanyahu's National Security Council. Um, and this was being reported as fact in Yediot Aranot in the top papers in the Israeli media. So they immediately went and scrubbed that, uh, the, scrubbed their, retracted their press release and replaced it with 40 passengers found without identification. And I showed the screenshot of the original press release and then the later press release. My blog began receiving unprecedented traffic, but it did very little to change the attitude of Israelis who are still driving around with bumper stickers. I mean, I was just there that say, we are all Shayatet 13. Um, or the Israeli media, Yediot Aranoth, published a uh, front page, um, on, on its front page, all of the um, members of the Shayatet 13 and said, these are our heroes, was the headline. Of course, they couldn't show their faces um, like the heroes of Israeli military past because they fear being um, tried for war crimes. So that is sort of the environment that I waded into when I got into Israel uh, in June 2010. And I think it's, uh, the, the atmosphere has only intensified in a more, and gone further into authoritarianism since then. Noam, do you want to take us? Okay, well, I'll uh, profit from the fact that I didn't have to go first, so I can come in and <laughs> <laughs> so I can expand on what Max was talking about. Uh, his last comment was that the uh, uh, rightward jingoist shift in Israel has intensified since he was there, and that's quite true. Uh, those of you who can read Hebrew at least uh, a couple of days ago. It was quite an important article written by the head of the, uh, in Hebrew, unfortunately, written by the head of the Israeli Bar Association, uh, not a raving radical, uh, on the coming triumph of fascism in Israel. Uh, it's the term he used, and it's the point of his article, and he was referring to, in part, to these uh, uh, legislation that's either a past or pending, which is getting... Uh, uh, more and more extreme, and also to the attitudes. Uh, the attitudes are uh, pretty much as Max described, in fact, very much. Uh, there's been a sharp turn to the right. Uh, actually, I wasn't going to talk about my not being allowed in, but uh, since you brought it up, the reason was very straightforward. My daughter and I were not allowed in, uh, not to Israel. We weren't intending to go to Israel, and that was the problem. If we were going to go to Israel, they would have let us in. The Minister of Interior, during these hours of investigation, kept asking the same question. Uh, why are you not going to Israel? Why are you just going to Palestine? 
uh, incidentally, to talk about U.S. foreign policy, uh, not even about Israel, which they knew. Uh, but uh, they, they have to, they're, they're, they're becoming more and more paranoid, more paranoid, more and more extreme, more and more worried about the uh, uh, delegitimation of Israel that's going on. It's much great concern to them. They're kind of circling the wagons. Uh, if you want some analogies, it's a little bit like uh, the mood in South Africa by the late 1970s when they recognized that they're becoming a pariah state and they actually became more aggressive. And there's something else that we should remember. They knew they could get away with it because the U.S. would back them. They didn't care, they said. In fact, the South African minister called in the American ambassador and said, yeah, we know we're becoming a pariah state. Everyone's voting against us at the U.N., but it really doesn't matter because there's only one vote at the United Nations. You know it, and we know it, and that's yours. And as long as you support us, it doesn't really matter what the world thinks. And that's very similar to this case. So um, Max pointed out, described the uh, very elaborate uh, Hasbara system, you know, propaganda system that they have in Israel, and it's uh, quite extreme. We don't have one here because we don't need it. Nothing's reported anyway without it. <laughs> and that's, that's a much deeper form of conformity and obedience, much deeper. Uh, the uh, uh, Mustafa, I guess it was, read the uh, commented on that Amnesty International report, uh, one of 19 humanitarian organizations that commented on the did a study, study of the alleged relaxation of the siege after the uh, uh, Mav Mavi Marna, Mar Marmara protests, and the AI uh, commentator uh, pointed out that there was. They said that the, uh, the, the effect of the relaxation of the siege had, was almost zero with regard to Gaza, but it did have one effect. It, uh, uh, it w uh, weakened the international protests against the siege. Now, he didn't add one important fact. It didn't weaken them in the United States because there weren't any. The United States was off the spectrum on this. And that's a point to remember when there is a growing, anybody who's been involved in this issue for decades, as I have, knows very well that uh, there's been a significant change in popular attitudes. Uh, it used to, meetings like this used to be impossible. Uh, first of all, it would be a scattered audience. The meetings would be broken up. You have to have police protection. And not very long ago on this campus, in fact, uh, and elsewhere. It's changed in the last 10 years or so. There's now a much wider recognition among the public, not in elite sectors much, don't see it in the media or commentary, but among the public there's a much wider recognition of the ongoing criminality of Israeli crimes, of Israeli actions. And these uh, particular atrocities like the Mavi Marmara, they heighten it, they organize and extend it. And that, that's led to a big change. But I stress Israeli actions. There's yet no breakthrough detectable one on what is much more important for us. These are not Israeli actions. They are U.S. Israeli actions without exception. And it goes way back. It goes through all the crimes, much worse ones than the ones that are taking place now. The 1982 invasion of Lebanon, uh, all kinds of things. Every single one of them goes on because of decisive U.S. military, diplomatic, uh, economic and crucially doctrinal support. Doctrinal support means shaping the interpretation of what's happening. And that paralyzes us. Uh, we can lament Israeli crimes or Iranian crimes or somebody else's crimes, but we can do something about U.S. crimes. And all of these are U.S. crimes. Uh, they rely crucially on what happens here. And uh, I think the real breakthrough in popular consciousness that's needed is bringing that understanding in. It is like South Africa in the late 70s and 80s. Uh, the Reagan administration continued to support South African atrocities right through the 1980s. In the late 80s, the Reagans, Reaganites had to violate congressional sanctions to increase support for South African crimes. It continued right to the end, as late as 1988, 
the uh, UN had long declared an embargo, Congress had passed sanctions. Uh, the uh, uh, Reagan administration uh, identified the uh, ANC, the African National Congress, as one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. Uh, so we therefore had to support South African apartheid in defending themselves against Mandela's terror. In fact, Mandela just got off the terrorist list two years ago. Before that, he had to have special dispensation to get into the United States. Well, then U.S. policy shifted right around 1990. U.S. policy shifted within a couple of years. Apartheid was at least formally over. Uh, that's what power is in the world. And it means that the popular power that we ought to be mobilizing, maybe inspired by what's happening under much harsher conditions in uh, the Arab world, uh, that popular power has to change U.S. policy. And until it does, there's going to be atrocity after atrocity. Um, I, I don't have an uh, autobiographical story about uh, the night of the flotilla attack, but I, I want to report something that I know firsthand, and that is as someone who, um, after 2001, decided I better know something about um, political Islam and the fundamental uh, books that are available in English by people like Said Khutb or Ali Shariati or uh, Mohammed Taha or others, um, because I knew nothing and I and I felt my ignorance. And I wrote a little book, uh, Thinking Past Terror: um, Islamism and Critical Theory on the Left. And uh, a colleague said, "Oh, what a brave book! It wasn't a brave book at all. This is a brave book." Uh, and th it reports bravery. But that book was so little. But even this little thing was difficult for my colleagues uh, in the academy to uh, understand because for them, uh, one, of the one of the lines I had crossed was to write about political Islam when I didn't know Arabic and was not an expert. And that's, this bothered me no end because no one was an expert in the United States except a very, very small group of professors in uh, uh, Near Eastern Studies who uh, uh, were not dealing with a more general uh, um, uh, undergraduate population. So I taught uh, political Islam for 10 years. Uh, no, not quite 10 years, eight years or something at, at Cornell. And I want to report something that I think is extremely um, uh, heartening. And that is, when I first started teaching it, uh, the, the, the Jewish students at Cornell were very nervous about this, and, and some of them quite hostile. Uh, but the last year I taught it, uh, and this, I think, goes into the um, idea of, this, of the questions that we were asked to respond to, um, the new generation, the new generation of students, and there happened to be two, uh, one one year and one another, uh, New York, uh, Jewish uh, young men who were students in this class, and in ca both cases they came from very conservative Jewish backgrounds. And in both cases, far from be alarmed about the teaching of political Islam, they took it upon themselves to learn Arabic and then go and spend a semester at the American University in Cairo. Um, so they, they really wanted to understand. And once they did, they had attitudes very, very similar to the one that, uh, one quotation that really struck me. Uh, this is by Daniel Lubin, um, who is writing about being um, accused of being anti-Semitic or anti-Israeli, disloyal, uh, whatever you want to say. And he says, uh, at some point, I simply got tired of these fratricidal and self-absorbed debates tired of the endless rhetorical dance, I stopped caring much about the pro-Israel label or whether others would consider me a true friend of Israel or whether I was abiding by the strictures of acceptable criticism. In the face of so much evident misery and injustice, these considerations came to seem self-indulgent and irrelevant. And then he goes on to say uh, something that I actually think is, is uh, extremely deep and yet um, it doesn't match the esoteric discussions of theory in the academy today. 
he says, either the Gaza blockade is just or it is not. Either the Lebanon war was wise or it was not. Either the U.S. should bomb Iran or it should not. Either the two-state solution remains viable or it does not. To reply to these questions with invocations of Judaism or anti-Semitism or the Holocaust is a sheer non sequitur, and when someone does so, it is generally a sign that uh, it is generally a sign that they have no good answers. Uh, it simply is it will not do to change the subject when these issues are on the table. And and here I also want to commend one of my uh, colleagues in theory in the academy. Um, I'm sure there are others in the audience, but I'm thinking of Slavo Žižek on Al Jazeera English. I'm sure many of you saw the, the wonderful clip of Slavo looking very Slavo-ish, except dressed up because he had a black uh, short sleeve t-shirt on. Next to, on a split screen, um, uh, uh, Tariq Ramadan, whose grandfather, as many of you know, in 1928 began the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, uh, Egypt and who also has had trouble coming to this country. And I had met Tariq at a conference in Rio uh, a, a month earlier. And of course, he's uh, uh, very uh, democratic. He's the whole new generation on the other side, which is the whole new generation of, of Muslims who uh, are uh, extremely sensitive to the importance of democracy. And uh, so there was Tariq looking very... Uh, ironed and white shirted, et cetera. And there was Slavoj, and, and Tariq has this clear-eyed look that those of you who have seen Slavoj realize it, it, it's not, it wasn't echoed on the other side of the screen. <laughs> and, um, and yet, you know, what was wonderful about uh, Slavoj was saying, look, this is, you don't have to know a lot of things. It's not about difference. It's not about otherness. This is a dictator in Egypt, and he is being thrown over by the people. That's all you need to know. We can stop right there. And uh, of course, Tariq Ramadan was delighted by this um, uh, indifference to difference. Um, and I think that this might be a kind of um, moment of transformation in the politics, particularly when it comes to a global public sphere. We spent a long time deferring to difference. and. Um, I myself, when I was teaching uh, uh, political Islam, d decided to study the whole history of Islam because I was a history under ma uh, undergraduate major, and I, you know, I realized that a thousand years were lacking in my understanding of uh, uh, the Mediterranean and uh, the rest of Europe, etc. Uh, and and yet, when I came through that, I realized that people like Said Qutb or Ali Shariati and Mohammed Taha belong in the same generation with Malcolm X, with Franz Fanon, and with other post-colonial thinkers who had to think themselves out of Western categories. And as soon as I did that, suddenly the whole thing opened up to me as much more accessible because I wasn't seeing it only as an issue of difference. So I, I think that that... Um, that's, uh, people may disagree with me, but I think that this moment, particularly when you see the people in, on the streets uh, in Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East, this is something that they are leading, the global uh, left or the global uh, movement for any kind of humanity. They are the leaders right now, and, and uh, solidarity is demanded uh, of us um, at this moment.